Our next speaker is uh, Enrico Giovannini, professor at the University of Rome, Tor Vergata, and a former minister of labor and social policies in his native country, Italy, uh, where he also previously served as the uh, head of ISTAT, uh, the Italian Statistics Agency. And in a previous life, Enrico was chief statistician at the OECD. Um, I'm very pleased to say that Enrico is also a very good friend of the EPSC. He's done a lot of work with us on uh, resilience, um, and he'll be speaking to us today uh, about from why to how operationalizing resilience and convergence in public policy. Enrico, over to you. Good morning, uh, and uh, thank you very much for inviting me uh, to speak at this important event, and especially to try to set the stage with uh, uh, this, with my uh, speech. These were the conclusions uh, that came from the ESPAS conference in 2016. The future is full of possible shocks, and we have to be able to imagine the in, in, unimaginable and thinking the unthinkable. What that do we mean by shock? We are coming out of a very, of a very serious crisis, so we have a bias. We mainly think about negative shocks, and this is what people normally think about, because we faced a huge negative shock. But we shouldn't forget that the word shock can be both positive or negative. And this is a key point of my argument today. Our fellow citizens uh, are still worried about the future. 40%, according to Eurobarometers, think that uh, the worst is still to come, which is a lower percentage compared to uh, a couple of years ago, but still is 40%. Therefore, we have to keep in mind that whatever we are going to propose, this is the feeling that uh, people have uh, when we speak. And of course, we are talking almost every day about uh, future risks. Slow growth, growing inequalities, climate change, technological shocks. We know that they are coming, and by the way, we just saw what uh, is happening in Portugal, Spain, Ireland, and so on. But uh, according uh, to the Institute dealing uh, with uh, natural disasters, we know that in 2016, 411 million people were hit by, national by natural disasters in the world, while in 2015 was less than 100 million. So it's fourfold. I always uh, remember to me, let's say, uh, remind to me what the treaty says about the aims of the Union. And this is, is important to keep this in mind because uh, the Article 3 talks about peace, values, well-being, sustainable development, balanced economic growth, competitiveness, uh, social market economy, uh, full employment, social progress, and so on and so forth. So this is what uh, we should deliver all together. This is what the expectations of uh, us as citizens is about. And by the way, I'm proud to be European because of Article 3. We often, we economists, often uh, simplify a little bit too much the, the way in which uh, our systems work. This is a, an oversimplification, of course. We have human needs, we built a machine, to produce as much GDP as possible in order to satisfy human needs. Of course, we know that the system is much more complicated. Don't worry. It's, we normally take natural capital, human capital, social capital, produce capital, we combine them in a production process to produce GDP. We reinvest part of it and we consume part of it for our well-being. But the way in which we organize the production process has an impact on well-being. And also the way in which we produce and the way in which we consume produces waste. In the sense of uh, Laudato Si Encyclica by Pope Francis, both physical wastes 
and human wastes. And in fact, this has an impact on the ecosystem services, but also in what I call social system services. And social system services is about hope, trust, and the vision of the future. So this is actually the system where we live, which now is, of course, evident to everybody because we are seeing the problems with the, the ecosystem, with the social system, much more than in the past. Now, in the roadmap prepared, presented by uh, President Juncker, there is an important reference to the need to produce a reflection paper towards the Sustainable Europe by 2030 on the follow-up of the UN SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals. And why is this important? Because if you look at the 17 goals within the system, the goals stop being a list. But in theory, is a great agenda for changing our system. And this is what we need. And uh, of course, it's not just about the environment. It's also about social issues. It's about economic issues, because shocks affect all these elements, and of course also institutional issues. Now, the question is, how can we create positive shocks for the EU? Also knowing, as Laurie said before, that negative shocks can happen coming from outside. But how can we produce positive shocks in order to transform our union and change the future? And how is the current EU policy framework able to deliver this result? A couple of years ago, EPSC and the Joint Research Center started the research project on resilience. And I'm very happy that uh, with the contribution of all DGs, we progressed in trying to develop uh, a common uh, definition of resilience, but also in how to use this concept as a guide for a policy framework. We already published this first paper in July, and uh, in the next few months, we will publish more results. The key point that I'm trying to use here is the notion of transformative resilience. I will come back on this. Resilience is normally the capacity of bouncing back when you have a shock. The key point is that we want to bounce forward, not to bounce back. You want to bounce back if you are on a sustainable development path. But if you are not, you have to use the crisis or the shocks or the positive shocks to bounce forward. Of course, this is not easy to achieve. And just look at this chart that we try to develop. It's important that we consider both the intensity of the shock, but also the time of exposure to the shock. And you may have uh, big shocks for a short time or small shocks for a long time, the slow burning process. And uh, if the shocks are small or short, we try to absorb them. Then uh, we try to adapt, but finally, in some cases, we have to transform. And the cost of trying first to absorb, then to adjust, before realizing that you need to transform, are huge. And this is the type of resistance that uh, we are facing uh, within Europe, but in all institutions, actually, as human beings. We are not really open to taking risks. A resilient society aims to sustain its level of individual societal well-being in the intergenerational dimension, as the Vice President just mentioned. Now, if you go back to the green chart that I mentioned before, we can talk about the resilience of assets, the resilience of this building to an earthquake, for example, but also the resilience of outcomes, that is what we want, in the bouncing forward model, and this depends on the resilience of the engine, of the system, which is due 
from the capacity of producing ecosystem services, social system services, institutions, and the production process. Looks complicated, but it's the way in which we behave. Now, how can we uh, learn something from the data that we have? The first, very first result, results that we have found looking at a lot of time series, uh, different countries and so on, is that uh, we shouldn't uh, put aside the, the social dimension when we look at the resilience of countries. If, you, if we broad the scope from economic to the entire system, the, the picture can change. This is just one chart showing uh, Let's say we were lucky that we had a big shock, so we can observe the resilience of our economies. I don't want to be cynical. Here, we looked at the resilience of economic and financial variables. Here, we have uh, the resilience of the system view during the crisis. If you have countries that are below uh, sorry, in the right hand side uh, of the chart, they had a high economic and financial resilience, but lower economic and uh, sorry, social resilience. And what about the recovery? Again, we have countries that uh, perform better in economic terms, but not in social terms, and vice versa. These are very preliminary results, and we are trying to do ma many more analysis on this data. What is the point? That if we want to transform this conceptual model into a policy framework, we have to focus on the classification of policies that is below. Policies that prevent shocks, that prepare to shocks, that protect, that promote, that transform. And these kind of policies have different roles in absorbing, in adapting, and in transforming. Not all policies fit for the moment, for the type of shock, and the type of needs that we have. Sorry. The prevention measures aim at reducing the impact and size of shocks. Preparation measures prepare businesses, people, institutions to manage the shocks. Protection measures is something that is very important to avoid the, the breakdown, sorry, the break of the system. Promotion measures and transformation measures. What if we redefine our structural reforms and non-structural reforms according to this kind of framework? Maybe we will better understand the, the possible inconsistencies, but the possibility of also of increasing uh, the cross-fertilization and uh, the synergies between policies. In uh, his last uh, um, book, Zygmunt Bowman called it Retrotopia, which is the idea of going back to a future, to a past that actually didn't exist. And this is what we are facing in Europe, in many countries. We should uh, try, I know that my time is almost finished, <laughs> but uh, I, ha okay, thank you very much. Uh, the idea is to build uh, uh, equitable and sustainable well-being uh, EU utopia, which is the treaty, but to do that, we need to invest in uh, resilient and sustainable assets, businesses, people and societies, institutions, territories. And if we think in these terms, maybe we have a, a better view of the system. By the way, this morning Bloomberg uh, uh, published this chart based on uh, the speech by the president of the Communist uh, Party. It's, it's, it's an interesting, uh, uh, I couldn't resist uh, to show it to you, is their attempt to have a more integrated view 
also because of the disasters that they created just focusing on the economic problems. So, what if we move uh, from uh, structural reforms to systemic transformative uh, policies? In my view, this would be a way to encompass much better both European and national policies, which must be mutually reinforcing. The new narrative uh, for the European semester, now the economic growth is gaining momentum, is needed because the reforms cannot be the same that we recommended uh, when the crisis was particularly large. A new narrative uh, for uh, Juncker to plan the multi-annual financial framework, but also for cohesion policy, for social euro, but also for uh, uh, many other funds that are not perceived currently in a coherent uh, framework. So, as uh, President Juncker said, we no now have a window of opportunity, but it will not stay open forever. Let us make the most of the momentum, catch the wind in our sails. And I think that this kind of uh, new framework could be a way to have more wind in our sails. Thank you very much.